All right, um, Book of Mark, very fast-paced. We saw last week that it was, it was meant to be read quickly. Book of Mark just clips along, uses a lot of action, action language. And so we're going, to, uh, we're going to keep that up. What we began last week, we did a whole chapter in one week. Uh, we're going to keep that up. We took 20 months to cover the Gospel of Matthew. We went slow. We went in detail. We took years to go through, to, to go through the Old Testament. But we're going to cruise through Mark rapidly. I'm not going to slow down for some of the minutiae. I'm not going to, to slow down. I want to keep clipping along, hopefully at, at chapter a week at least. Uh, and we'll be d- into Luke then in no time, in which I want to dial it back again, and we're going to go through Luke nice and slow, step by step. So that, Lord willing, that's the plan. Uh, if the Lord doesn't come back, if he does come back, that's even better. Uh, but uh, we're going to go through uh, to book of Mark very quickly. Uh, but before we get into it today, <clears throat> years ago when we f- started Foundation Bible Church, first in a in my parents' living room, then we moved over to my brother's dining room and kitchen, then we've been at, what, Beloit Historical Society, a uh, couple schools in Milton, a uh, uh, hotel. We've been, we've been all over the place, different meeting places before we came here. One of the things that we've always tried to do is speak honestly when a scripture portion is difficult. And we haven't tried to uh, skip it, ignore it. Uh, we haven't tried to pretend like there are not difficulties in the Bible. There are, there are difficulties in the Bible. There are translation problems in the Bible. There are things that maybe this side of heaven we're not going to figure out. But I've always tried to be very honest when I don't understand anything. I just want to tell you, I don't understand it. And uh, because I'm so solid and so confident about 99 point something percent of this scripture, I want to be very honest about the small places that are, that are in, in doubt. Uh, and today we're going to actually deal with one of those places that's a vexing problem. It's been a difficult problem for scholars for, for hundreds of years. It's a famously difficult to translate portion of scripture, so we don't know what the correct translation is. And I'll let you know, again, I don't have the answer. But that's not a reason to skip it. We've done this before. We don't skip difficult parts and we don't pretend to know the answers when we don't. The trouble is found in Mark chapter 2, 25 through 26. And I, I'm skipping the end because I don't want to end with this. I want to get it out of the way so we can get at the meat what Mark is really about. And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread when it was not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests, and he gave it to those who were with him. Now, this is referencing a story in 1 Samuel. Listen to when I read this, 1 Samuel 21, uh, 1 through 3, where the story is first mentioned. David went to Nob to Ahimelech, the priest. Ahimelech, troubled when he met him, asked, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered to him, elect the priest. The king sent me on a mission, which wasn't true. David was running. Uh, no, one, uh, no one is to know anything about this mission I'm sending, you, I'm, I'm, I'm sending you on. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, uh, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. And uh, the Ahimelech, the high priest, the, the, the priest at the, in Nob, then gives him consecrated bread that was uh, before the Lord. There seems, do you notice anything strange here? Did anybody notice anything strange? Yeah. There seems to be an error, what looks like an error in the text at first glance. Ahimelech was priest. Now we know from Scripture that his son's name was Abiathar. Now his son is not mentioned in the Old Testament text. He's later appointed high priest by David, and he's actually more famous than his father. So, what's going on here? A lot of times when I do this, then I think I have something that's kind of cool that fixes the problem. What's going on here? Nobody knows what's going on here. This is famously difficult, and it's not like we have an answer that we can say, oh yeah, that's it. There's at least 10 theories that have been put forward, and I I researched uh, all of them. Uh, It's possible, here's just a few of them. How about this? 
Peter misquoted Jesus. How's that sit with you? Mark, when, remember Mark was probably uh, uh, writing this down as he heard it from, from Peter. So then the other possibility is, well, maybe Mark misheard Peter. He's remembering Peter incorrectly, and Mark wrote it down incorrectly. How about uh, Jesus was mistaken? How about that? That's interesting, though. Uh, Jesus was sinless. We know this from Scripture. But when he was learning to walk, did he ever stumble? Did he ever trip? Did he ever forget something? Oh, yeah, what was that? And one of the Peter would have to say, they say, and he'd say, oh, yeah. Uh, what if, as a human being, he simply misspoke? This was not a sin, but he misspoke. And then uh, Peter remembered what Jesus said, and Peter didn't know the Old Testament or something, so he said it the way Jesus said it, and then Mark wrote it down. Uh, that's probably possible. Some people think that's possible. Uh, some people say that the text in Mark has been corrupted, and there are, like, the end of Mark is, is definitely in doubt, and there are portions of Scripture that uh, have been corrupted. There's different, uh, and there, there is some evidence that the, that the text here has been corrupted. In fact, we know it has, because some of the ancient manuscripts delete the phrase when Abiathar was high priest. So there are ancient texts of Mark out there that don't even have that line in there. But it seems like these, and, and by the way, when Matthew tells the story, he doesn't mention Abiathar, the high priest. So even though Matthew, either Mark came out of Matthew, like we said, and was a short version, or Matthew incorporated Mark in, in huge chunks and just wrote the rest of his gospel around it, whatever the case, they're different on this point. And there are ancient texts of Mark that don't have when Abiathar was high priest. Unfortunately, at this time, those seem to be later documents, and they seem like scribes trying to correct what they thought was an error in the text. So it seems like, as best as we can know now, the oldest, most reliable texts of Mark do have when Abiathar was high priest. The other Gospels don't say this. Other possibilities are that the Old Testament text was the one that was corrupted and not the New Testament text. And guess what? We've got good evidence for that, too. Uh, we know that in the Old Testament especially, sometimes numbers and dates and names don't match up between two accounts of the same event. They just don't. Uh, if this were true, then maybe Jesus, if it was the Old Testament text that was corrupted, then maybe Jesus, as God, was correcting the first account in Samuel. Now this is actually possible because we have an ancient biblical text that reverses the order and says that Abiathar was the father of Ahimelech. Isn't that funny? We've got ancient texts. They all say uh, Ahimelech was the father of Abiathar, but we've got this one strand of translation, uh, Syriac or Syrian, I can't remember what it's called, that it reverses the order and says that Abiathar was the father of Ahimelech. Uh, instead, it's the other way around. But that one does seem to be the unusual text. So again, it seems like the Old Testament text was, was not corrupted. Uh, <coughs> The other possibility that seems to be common among a lot of scholars, I think it sounds reasonable to me at least, is that a better translation, because this is a very difficult portion to translate, it's not when Abiathar was high priest, but in the day of Abiathar the high priest. And that's a big difference. Now, there's a trouble with that. If you translate this phrase, in the day of Abiathar the high priest, there is textual evidence elsewhere in the Bible and outside the Bible of translating it that way, in the day of Abiathar the priest, means he was just alive at that time. That was during the lifespan of Abiathar the high priest. However, Mark doesn't use it that way ever, only in this place, if that were the way. The good news is, if you translate it when Abiathar was high priest, also that would be the only time Mark translates it that way. It's hard to translate. Smart people don't know how to translate this. So is it when Abiathar was high priest, because that would contradict the Old Testament, or is it saying in the day of Abiathar the high priest, meaning in that generation when the famous pre high priest lived, again, this passage is incredibly difficult to translate and to, and to read it as in the day of Abiathar is a valid way to translate it that is found elsewhere in the scripture, but there's no way to be sure. We, we just can't know. A simple solution is that we know from the Old Testament that father and son were both priests at Nob, and so the son was probably there when the father gave the bread to David, and since he would become the high priest and he would become more famous of the two, that's why Jesus mentioned him and not says father. I mean, 
that's very possible as well. The first text, Samuel, is about 3,000 years. First Samuel is about 3,000 years old, and Mark was written about 2,000 years ago, very close to the time of the uh, death and resurrection of Christ. There is no definite answer. This is one of those few thorny sections of the Bible, and I say few because this is, I said 99.99, 99.99 something. This Bible is rock solid. There, people sometimes are upset when, when I say that there's different, there's different ancient texts. That should not upset us. There's only two ways God could have preserved scripture. One is by waving a magic wand and every single scribe could have never possibly made a mistake. Or what God did do was that you have all these ancient texts, thousands of them. And when you come to the New Testament, they're, they're in uh, Armenian, they're in, they're in uh, Greek, they're in Latin, they're in Aramaic, they're, they're in... Uh, 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 you, uh, Anyways, I'm forgetting some of the other languages. But they're in many, many different languages, and you have these different trees where it would be translated. There were different geographies spread out by hundreds of miles, and so you see translation. You can see an error creep in the text here, and it's like a tree, and it gets copied out. But then you could compare it to the other places where you have ancient texts, and that's how we arrive at what we have. Not the magic wand that nobody ever made a mistake, but that we have all this huge bunch of scriptures and so we can see what's there and this is an absolute fact and even enemies of christianity even scholars that don't believe jesus is god have to admit that there's not one major doctrine that's anywhere near in doubt the central truths of christianity are absolutely solid and it, it gets it goes beyond that this book is rock solid uh, when i went to moody bible institute in, in down near chicago very conservative very evangelical uh, school uh, they spoke about the fact that if you took all of the places in Scripture that are in doubt, aside from Jeremiah, remember there's a different size book of Jeremiah found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Aside from the book of Jeremiah, all the other texts of Scripture, the changes, which are mostly dates, names, and numbers, and in the end of Mark, it would be about two pages. I want you to look at this. When people say, oh, I can't believe the scripture, I can't believe the scripture, because, and then they'll find one verse here, one verse there, that never have anything to do with, that, with God's salvific plan, with, never have anything to do with the truths that God wants us to know about him, who we are, his plans for us. <laughs> when none of these are in doubt and they're pointing, this verse is about who gave David bread. That's what we're in doubt about. The rest of this text, it's unbelievably rock solid. There's nothing else like it in the history of the world. So I hope that you don't use that as an excuse to, to just go off your rocker. But I know many people, and the reason we're talking about it is because many people will grab a hold of small things here and there. There's very few, like about two pages in the whole Bible, and use this as an excuse to keep God at bay. I don't want to hear from God. I don't want to think about God. Uh, and there are a number of possible explanations, and we went through several of them. And I'm not going to know this side of heaven unless we dig up something spectacular. But I trust that it's going to be okay. And I'm, I'm curious about these things. So I think that if it's, if it's possible and if, if God, you know, if we're not too filled up with other things, I want to track it down in heaven. I want to find out uh, just, just for the sake of curiosity. But this book is spectacular in how solid it is and how much... You can, you can trust in it to tell the true story of Jesus Christ working with his people and the story of his life on earth and what he's done for us and how we can find salvation and eternal life through faith in him. Okay, let's get started. Let's uh, turn to Mark chapter 2. So that was the difficulty with the text, this, this, this verse here about who gave David bread. Now let's get down to what the book is about. Let's get down to the book, why it, chapter 2 is there. What did, what did uh, Jesus have for us? A few days later, after the events of chapter 1, uh, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. That was kind of his base of operations. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some came uh, some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man uh, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they, uh, there was an outside staircase in these houses. They climbed to the roof. They made an opening in the roof above Jesus. So here he is preaching. Can you imagine? And the roof starts crumbling. And, it, and while he's preaching to these people, they lower down 
this cot with their friend on it. That must have been quite a scene. I wonder, did Jesus chuckle or did he look like, what's going on here? What, what was that like? Some of the men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof, which was, with, which was a thatched roof covered with mud. You could walk around up there, but you could also dig through it. Uh, by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Notice, this man's salvation did not begin with him, did it? Jesus said, he saw, Jesus saw this faith of his friends. And he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. His salvation began with the faith of his friends, the effort that they took. Jesus saw their faith, and as a result, of this, uh, and as a result, this man was saved. He was blessed to have friends who cared enough, and he was forgiven of his sins. So the question is, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, in your life, which of your friends, which of your family members, which of your co-workers could also be lucky enough to have you as their friend? That actually, if you have to, you'd physically carry them to church. If you have to do whatever you can do to physically bring them into the presence of Jesus Christ, are, you, are the people in your life blessed to have you as your friend? This man was saved. He was forgiven of his sins. He got to go to heaven because his friends cared enough to overcome every obstacle to bring him to Jesus, to take them to Jesus, to carry them to Jesus, to get past every, every roadblock Make a tremendous effort just so that they can meet Jesus Christ and be saved. Don't you want to be a friend like that? Don't you want your friends to rejoice with you in heaven and look over and you know, thank you, God, that, that you bless my efforts to bring this person to you, to bring this person to Christ. What are we living our lives for? Last week, Jesus called the disciples. He says, come on, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Let's go out there. Let's collect everyone we can. And if we have to break down walls to bring them to Jesus, let's do it. And I pray that everybody in this church knows the joy of bringing a sister or a brother, a friend, a family member, a coworker to faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that you'll have that opportunity this year to pray with somebody and lead them to Jesus Christ. And maybe they'll say, boy, I'm so lucky to have you as a friend. I'm so lucky that you brought me to Jesus. Okay, let's look at verses 6 and 7 now. Not everybody was happy what was going on there. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, they're thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? You know what? I think that's an incredibly reasonable response. If somebody says, son, your sins are forgiven, I'm going to be thinking, who does this guy think he is? Who does he think? Nobody can forgive sins, except for God. It's reasonable for them to say, what's going on here? So they're, so they're looking at that, and uh, they're thinking in their hearts, why does this guy, this dude, talk like that? He's actually blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So right here, right away in chapter 2, we come to the crux of the matter. Luke, I mean, I mean, Mark is moving fast. Right here, right here. Who is this man that he says, I can forgive sins? Because nobody can do that except for God alone. Immediately, that fast language again, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, because he's a prophet. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Oh, well, I don't know. Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I want you to know, Jesus says. So he said to them, I tell you, get up, take your mat, go home. He got up, he took his mat, and he walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We've never seen anything like this. By the way, the name of today's sermon is Jesus is Not Normal. 
We've never seen anything like this, and kind of isn't that the point? Everyone knows that's the point. They've never seen anything like it. Jesus can forgive sins. That's the point. Never seen anything like this before. That's the point. Mark is showing us right away who is this Jesus that the early church, first century church, is worshiping. This is the first or second gospel. This is one of the first gospels written. They need to know right away all these stories they've been hearing about Jesus. Here it is. Here is the Jesus that you are worshiping, God incarnate, God in flesh. There has never been anything like Jesus. Some people say he's a good teacher. If your math teacher says, son, your sins are forgiven, he's weird. None of my teachers, I had some good teachers. I had a lot of good teachers. Really enjoyed most of my teachers. I enjoyed all my teachers. Uh, none of them ever said to somebody who is paralyzed, why don't you stand up and start walking? There's nothing like Jesus. We think that in the old times there was all these miracles going on all the time. No, there wasn't. That's why they were amazed. There's been nothing like Jesus. He was not normal. He was unusual. This was an aberration in history. Not then, not now, not at any time in history. This is highly unusual. And that's the difference that points us to who he really is. Just as it pointed the very first, that's just as it pointed these witnesses. Jesus says, I want you to know this. I have authority to forgive sins. And he does this miraculous healing. So not only that audience and not only us, but the very first readers of the Gospel of Mark, it all pointed to the same conclusion. Jesus is not normal. This is God. This is God in flesh who's come down to save us from ourselves. Last week we saw Jesus show love for a leper. In a culture where a leper had to walk down the street saying, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, nobody would come near him. Nobody would touch him. Nobody would give them a hug. In that culture, this leper comes to Jesus. Imagine his emotions. He says, if you're willing, could you heal me? Humbly asking, is it okay? Can I even approach you with this? And Jesus puts his hand on him, says, I'm willing, and heals him. A leper was an outcast. And Jesus, maybe for the first time in years, somebody put his hand on their shoulder, grabbed his arm, or put his arm around him, and he healed him. That's Mark showing us. Who is your God? Who is the God you are following? This is your God. He puts his arm around an outcast. He heals. He has time with the unimportant people in life. Today we'll see Jesus befriend a different kind of outcast, a traitor. A collaborator with the Romans. How do you feel about a collaborator? How do you feel about traitors? How exciting would it be if, if somebody who just betrayed the United States and I'm saying, hey, guys, we've got a new buddy at church. I think I might catch some flack. How easy would it be today for a national figure, think about this, a well-known pastor or a TV personality or, or a politician who has ambitions for the White House to befriend a traitor, a collaborator with an occupying army? Not easy. It would have been even more difficult back then. <coughs> and yet Jesus... Be friends, this man. If it was Jesus' plan to become pop, a popular rebel leader with lots of earthly power, he really failed at that. <laughs> he did a lousy job. He never raised an army in his life. He did things that were unpopular. He loved unpopular people. If his ambition was earthly gain, he was horrible at it. You don't touch untouchables unless you've got a photo op. And you really don't befriend collaborators. That's just bad PR. Come on, Jesus. I can, let me handle your public relations. I can do a better job. And some of the things you're saying, not so much. You've got to tone that down. All that repent stuff, people don't like to know they're wrong. Jesus did a bad job. Let's look at now at, at uh, 13 through 17. 13 through 17. Mark chapter 2, 13 through 17. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake, a large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he was walking, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Levi is another name for, for Matthew. A lot of people had two names back then. Sitting at the tax collector's booth, so it sounds like he's maybe uh, uh, like a, a toll booth, like you find on the way to Illinois. Uh, those are manned by traders. No, no, no. 
Uh, I heard an amen out there, yeah. Uh, follow me, Jesus told him. In the force of Jesus' personality, the, his pure goodness, his authority, he says, follow me. And G Levi got up and he followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and with his disciples. And some people think the sinners might talk about uh, prostitutes or immoral people. Other people think it's a, a term. Uh, oftentimes, the ancient Jewish world called sinners. It was their word for, for Gentiles. So in other words, he's with tax collectors and maybe Romans or Greeks. Uh, they were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who had followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners, you can't eat with a Gentile or a prostitute, and, and tax collectors, they asked the disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick, which he was probably quoting a proverb. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. And the ironic part is, Jesus knows that nobody is righteous before God. But if you think you're righteous, if you think, I don't need God, I'm doing fine on my own, if you think I'm basically pretty good, I can accomplish this on my own, then that's what self-righteous means. And Jesus says, if we're righteous in ourselves, he's not here for us. But if you're a sinner, you know you're a sinner. And this was the story of the Beatitudes, remember? God's message that he bring to earth, the Beatitudes, the greatest sermon ever given, God says those who are broken in spirit, in other words, those who know they are morally bankrupt, are blessed, are happy, they're lucky. Our first step to getting right with God is to know we're a sinner because if we think we're righteous, we can never get right with God. And Jesus says, I'm not for you because you don't get it. But I will come and save, I will seek, I will chase after those who realize how desperately they need a Savior. This is a warning uh, brothers and sisters, this is a warning. If your religion is making you feel about yourself in such a way that the cross isn't a big deal to you anymore, or maybe you're very content with your life and say, I'm basically a good person, I'm better than those people, I don't really need church, this is a warning. Jesus says you're missing it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Are you righteous really? Think about it. Be honest with yourself. If you're not righteous, you're a sinner. If you're a sinner, you need a Savior. Amen? Amen. So I hope nobody misses that who's watching this on the Internet or on television or here today. Be honest with yourself. If you're not righteous, you need a Savior. You need Jesus. Okay, 18 through 22, we're going to talk about new wine. Now Jesus' disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting but yours are not. In fact, they're going to banquets. Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they are with him, uh, so long as he is with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. And this is, this is a foreshadowing. This is talking about the crucifixion. Jesus is talking about his death right here. No one sews a patch on unshrunken cloth. Uh, no one sews, sews a patch of unshrunken cloth on an old garment. If they do, the new patch will pull away from the old, making it tear, making the tear worse. And people do not pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. The idea a wineskin is made out of skin, made out of leather. Uh, the idea is when you pour wine in there, when it's new, it's going to ferment. When it ferments, it expands. And if you fill it up to the side of the skin that's already taut, when it expands, it's going to burst. It's going to break it. So you have to pour new wine into new wine skin, something brand new. Jesus knew that what he was doing didn't fit with Old Testament Judaism. He was inaugurating a brand new era in the history of God's relationship with humanity. He, this is not by mistake. He absolutely knew what he was doing. We're going to shake things up. Jesus is doing something new. God is good something new. And so there's new wine. We need new wine skins. In our lives, brothers and sisters, don't try to put Jesus into your old lifestyle. He don't fit. When we come to Jesus, it's a new life. It's supposed to be a new life. 
and we can't fit Jesus into the old life, let the Holy Spirit in. He's going to grow in our lives. The Holy Spirit's going to expand in our lives. The Holy Spirit, as he grows and expands, will reshape us into something brand new. The Bible calls this being born again. Well, what I was talking about there was sanctification. But when we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, that's being born again. J. Vernon McGee puts it this way. The Lord is giving us two illustrations about the new life of love and fellowship with him. He is saying that he does not come to polish up the law. He didn't come to add to the Mosaic law. He didn't come to add a refinement or a development to the Old Testament law. He came to do something new. He didn't come to patch up an old garment, but to give us a new garment. Under the law, men worked, and their works were like an old moth-eating garment. Our Lord came to provide us a new robe of righteousness that comes down onto a sinner who will put his trust in Jesus Christ. This will enable him to stand before Almighty God. This is glorious. This is a wonderful thing that he is saying here, friend. Our Lord didn't come to extend or project the law of the Old Testament system or of religion. He came to introduce something new, and that which is new will be the fact that he will die for the sins of the world. New wine goes into new wineskins. A new garment uh, goes onto a new man. That robe of righteousness comes down on one who through faith has become a son of God. This is a tremendous thing and jesus knew absolutely what he was saying he wasn't rocking the boat he was sinking the boat he was absolutely changing everything let's look now from verse 23 i'm going to go 23 to the end this time he answered have you never read what david did when he and his companions were hungry and in need in the days of abiathar the high priest he entered the house of god and ate the consecrated bread which is lawful only for the priest to eat and he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for the people, not people for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man, Jesus' favorite term for himself, is Lord even of the Sabbath. Boom. Quick moving book says an awful lot. We've learned a lot about who Jesus is in these last two weeks. Here's our last revelation about who Christ is, why he's not normal. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. We also see here that we human beings aren't made for the Sabbath. Sabbath at that time was on Saturday to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, Christians began to meet on Sunday. Uh, the Sabbath is made for us. Why? Because we need it. A legalistic relationship with God says, you must attend church every week or else. A loving relationship with God says, I need to spend time with God and his people. It's like the air I breathe. I crave it. I look forward to it. I can't wait for Sunday. And that's the difference between legalism and love. The Sabbath rest has two meanings for us as Christians, and both are important. One, on the Sabbath, we receive instruction and encouragement in our faith, and all of us need that. And secondly, on the Sabbath, we rest from our physical labors or our usual employment. We need both of these things to be healthy physically and spiritually. It's good to have a day of rest. It's good to come back and, and remind ourselves why we love the Lord. The Barnes commentary puts it this way. Man was made first, and then the Sabbath was appointed for his welfare. Genesis 2, 1 through 3. It would not be for our real good, but for our real and eternal injury to devote the Sabbath to vice, to labor, or to amusement. Hebrews 10.25 puts it this way, And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another. See, that's my prayer this morning. I was talking a lot about encouragement, right? One of the things we do at church is we encourage one another. Let us not neglect, Hebrews 10.25, neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And it's nearer now than when this was written. Simply put, fall in love with Jesus and come to his house. The Lord's house, each week. Come and be blessed and be a blessing to your brothers and sisters. So let's be blessed because Mark has shown us in two chapters that we have a Savior who brought a message that we should repent of our sins. Very first message of Jesus, repent, the kingdom of God is near. Believe the good news. He's given us a mission to be followers. He said, come, I will make you fishers of men that should all work on catching people. That's the responsibility of every Christian. Our Savior is all-powerful. Even the demons obey him, we saw in chapter 1. But even with his great power, he reaches out in compassion to the lonely, to the outcast, to the downtrodden. He's willing to forgive all our sins. He is the great physician. 
He calls us to follow him as he reaches out to love uh, the unrighteous and the unlovely, the, unlove, the people that are difficult to love. He has brought us new life, life bought with his death on the cross, which we see foreshadowed in chapter 2. He is Lord of the Sabbath. And fast-moving Mark has shown us all of these things in two quick chapters. Can't wait to see what comes next. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, thank you that we can trust this book. Thank you that we can see your son Jesus. Thank you that Mark took the time to write this down for us. Help us, Lord, to, to love you and to follow you each and every moment of our lives. And thank you, Lord, for our brothers and sisters. Praise your name. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.